Now, now I need for you to kind of bear with me tonight. I'm going to, I'm going to preach to uh, me. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody asked me, so how do, you, how do you know what to preach to? Whatever. Well, I preach to myself, and I figure you guys pretty much like me. And uh, so I'm, uh, I'm preaching to me. But I'm going, to, I'm going to share a message tonight. It's probably, I think, the, uh, the greatest revival message that we could need and that we need to hear tonight. And, and so uh, I, kind of, I, I kind of want you to kind of bear with me and be with me. Uh, so are you going to listen to me? Say amen. Amen. All right. Uh, you know, God called me to the ministry of communication. I mean, that's, you know, that's what I do. And uh, so I really want to communicate this tonight in a in a powerful way, in a good way. So I really ask that you, uh, you pray for me. There was this, uh, this guy, uh, and, and uh, he was a businessman, and he got transferred down to Florida. And uh, so uh, his company uh, wanted to send him a bouquet of flowers uh, down in Florida to be in his new office when he got in his new office. And so they called this florist up and ordered the flowers. And also on that same day, uh, there was a funeral and, uh, and this family had called the florist up for, for a funeral arrangement, and uh, the same florist, and uh, they got the orders mixed up. And so they sent the flowers that were supposed to go to the funeral to the guy in Florida, and they sent the flowers that went to the guy in Florida to the funeral. So the guy in Florida, when he gets and opens up his office and he sees this bouquet of flowers, he wants to see who it's from, so he reads the card, and it said, Rest in Peace. And he thought, well, that's kind of strange. I mean, maybe this job is not good, you know. But what was really weird is that at the funeral, there was a flower arrangement. And the card said, good luck in your new location. Hope it's not too hot down there. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway... Uh, you know, so I, you, know, you can miss, you know, you get in trouble if you miscommunicate. So I really, I really want to be clear tonight. You know, you can take a verse of scripture, you can take some things out of scripture and have good meaning and have good context with it, but you can kind of misinterpret it. Like the old preacher that uh, was looking at his Bible and he was reading this, the story of Naaman the leper and he interpreted his Naaman as the leaper. And, uh, and he said, you know, that's what we need, folks. We need more leapers. Bless God, Naaman was a leaper. He leaped everywhere he went. That's what we don't. We got enough sitters. We got enough walkers. Man, bless God, we need some leapers. And I, you know, and so the bottom line is, I mean, that's good content, but it's a misinterpretation of the Scripture. So what I'm going to do tonight is uh, I'm going to kind of do that. So I want you to stick with me. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture. And once again, I want you to hear it like you've never heard it before. Because tonight... We're going to talk about the prodigal son, but, but I want you to see it in a new light, and I want you to see the story of the prodigal son within the context that God meant for it to be in, uh, in, the, uh, in the first place. Now, so I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15. Gospel of Luke chapter 15. And uh, in order to understand the context that the prodigal son... Uh, is in, you have to read chapter 15 beginning at verse 1. Uh, so that's where, that's where we're going to start when we're talking about the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15 and uh, beginning at verse 1 because this sets the stage of the context by which Jesus shared with us the parable of the prodigal son. Luke chapter 15 verse 1, then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. Talking about Jesus. And everybody just look up here. I, I, I talked about this Sunday. Uh, you know, tax collectors and sinners are not in the same category. Uh, tax collectors are in a category all of their own. Uh, it's because in Jewish minds and in Jewish circles in Jesus' day, tax collectors were worse than sinners. Tax collectors were those Jews uh, that deliberately went to the Roman government the Roman government that had the Jewish nation in slavery, they went to the Roman government and said, hey, if you'll make us a tax collector, uh, we'll take taxes for you from our own people. The Roman government said, yeah, if you want to do that, that's okay. And if you want to rob, if you want to steal from them, anything you want to put under the table, you can go ahead and you have the backing of the Roman government to do it. Nobody's going to say anything to you. So in Jewish minds and Jewish hearts and Jewish eyes, Tax collectors were traitors. Tax collectors were hated. Uh, tax collectors were the worst of the worst. They were worse than the worst sinner 
you could imagine. That's why when you talk about tax collectors and sinners, they're always in a category of their own. And tax collectors had nobody else to hang around with but other tax collectors because nobody would have anything to do with them and other sinners. So, so in the context, verse 1, then all of the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. Pharisees and the scribes were the religious people of Jesus' day. Whatever you think about the Pharisees and the scribes, they are at least people that behaved themselves. They are people that lived pure. They lived clean. They fasted. They prayed. They worshipped. They went to the temple. They were, they were clean, living people. They were the religious people of Jesus' day. And I've always thought that it was funny that the people that were nothing like Jesus were the only ones that liked Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees, who were the religious people, who should have known about Messiah, should have known about what the Bible, the prophecies about Jesus were going to be. And as a matter of fact, Jesus told one of those Pharisees that he should have known it. His name was Nicodemus. And Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you mean to tell me that you're a ruler of the Jew, that you're, you're a Pharisee, you're a student of the word of God, and you don't know these things? And so the scribes and the Pharisees are outside complaining that the tax collectors and sinners are around Jesus and that Jesus has not shooed them off and that Jesus is delighting even in sitting down and eating with them. Now, it is in that context that you have to keep everything else that goes on in the book of Luke chapter 15 in mind. Are you with me? Say amen. All right. So it's in that context that everything else Jesus says in Luke 15 has to do with the fact that he knew that there were tax collectors and sinners and that there were scribes and Pharisees that hated him being around the tax collectors and the sinners. Now, the reason why I know that is because if you look at these connecting words in the Gospel of Luke, you'll see this. So look at verse 3. So, so, now, so what? So because Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners and the scribes and Pharisees are outside complaining about it, so because of that, he spoke this parable unto them. Now, Jesus proceeds to tell three stories in context with the fact that what we just read in verses 1 and verses 2. So he begins to tell these three stories, and all three of these stories are connected to the foundation that there are tax collectors and sinners enjoying being around Jesus and yes, Jesus even enjoying being around them and the religious people can't stand it and they're griping and they're complaining about it. So he tells this parable about the, about the, the shepherd that has a hundred sheep. One sheep leaves and he leaves the ninety and nine to go rescue the one sheep. So we know that story. Then go down to verse 8. Or, so now the story that he's getting ready to tell about the woman that has the coins, it's connected to verse 3. It's connected to the story that Jesus just told about the shepherd and the sheep. And both of those stories are connected with verses 1 and 2. Are you with me so far? Somebody say amen. All right? Now, then you go down to verse 11, and it says, And he said a certain man had two sons. So now, now we get to it. Now when you get down to verse 11, we are, we're, we're, we're getting into the parable of the prodigal son. But keep in mind, the prodigal son, the widow with the coins, the lost sheep, all of them are connected. They're connected with the fact that Jesus was with tax collectors and sinners and the religious people do not like it. Now, when you get into the parable of the prodigal son, you will find that Jesus begins this parable by saying, 
a certain man had how many sons? Come on, class, talk to me. How many sons? Two sons. So when you preach and you teach about the parable of the prodigal son, you are not doing this story justice if you only talk about one son. This story was always meant to be about two boys and not one boy. Now, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with preaching about the prodigal son. Uh, I, I used to always preach, and I still do, uh, preach about the prodigal son that went off. You know the story. Wanted, it, wanted the inheritance. He went off. He ran wild. He wasted, his, he wasted his life in riotous living, the Bible says. Came to himself. What am I doing? I mean, he ends up in a hog pen, which is the worst place in the world for a Jewish boy to be. Can you imagine? And he says, he comes to himself, he repents, he says, my father will take, I just, want, I just want to be one of my father's servants. You know the story. You know that. And so most every preacher, and every time you have heard the parable of the prodigal son, it has been in an evangelistic situation. It has been an evangelistic message. Nothing wrong with that. The bottom line is, though, that is not the context which Jesus meant for this story to be told. This is not an evangelistic message. The prodigal son was not a lost boy. The prodigal son had a father. The prodigal son had a good father. The prodigal son left the father, but he was still the father's son. How many of you say amen to that? Amen? He's still the father's son. Now, yes, 10,000 times yes, the prodigal son ain't no good. The prodigal son is rebellious. And so it doesn't have anything to do with, the, with how bad the prodigal son is. This has everything to do with how good the father is. And all God's people said. So now the bottom line is, though, is that the prodigal son, this is not an evangelistic story. Now, once again, I don't criticize anybody preaching that as an evangelistic message. It makes a great evangelistic message. But I'm not preaching that tonight as an evangelistic message. I'm preaching to those of us, and I told you I'm preaching to myself, that have known Christ for a while. I'm preaching to those tonight, and that's why I say this is a vital revival message, because once again, you've got to be vibe before you can be revived. So I'm preaching to all of us, all of us that have known Christ for a little while, because this parable is about us. Why? Because it has always been about two boys. It's always been about a man that has two sons. So, this young man, this prodigal, leaves the father. Because, not, because, not because he's the father's bad. No, he's bad, but the father's good. But he leaves the father because he really doesn't understand and know the heart of his father. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me and listen well. How many of you know that you can be saved, you can be born again, and you still don't really know God? I, I think it's a misnomer when we tell people, hey, do you know God? And, and I know what we mean by that. We mean, are you saved? Are you born again? But the bottom line is, I know a lot of people that have been saved a long time, but they still don't walk with God. They still don't talk with God. God never, the, 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 the word of God has not locked, unlocked its message to them. They have saved, they're on their way to heaven because you didn't do anything to deserve heaven. It's by the grace of God and all God's people said. But just because you're saved don't mean that you know God. Matter of fact, what did Jeremiah say? Jeremiah said, if you're going to boast on something, don't boast on how much money you got. Don't bo boast on your riches. Don't boast on your education. Don't boast how much you know. If you're going to boast on anything, boast that you know the living God. And all God's people said, so this young man, even that, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm just telling you right now, you can, you can be with your parents. You can be, and you really don't know your parents. That's what breaks parents' heart. That's what breaks my heart. When, you know, when my kids were living at home, I had teenagers. Anybody have, anybody have teenagers right now? Raise your hand. If you got teenagers in the house, raise your hand. Okay, these are the people you really need to fast and pray for, all right? Amen? I mean, but hang in there. I'm going to tell you, you've got teenagers right now. Don't kill them because one day they'll give you grandkids. Oh, glory. That's going to be awesome. But one of the things 
that really bothered me when I had teenagers in the house is that they were always telling me, Dad, you don't understand me. You don't know me. That's not fair. You don't know who I am. You ain't the boss of me. Whereas I proceeded to lay hands on them in Jesus' name. And what bothered me about that, and by the way, it does get better. They grow out of it. I hope they do. They, mine did. But what bothered me is the whole time they were saying, Dad, you don't understand me. The real problem was they didn't understand me. They didn't understand my heart. I mean, it's amazing. My kids would come at me, Dad, can I go to this party? No. Well, why not? And then I would proceed to tell them why. I mean, I would tell them from my heart, well, honey, I don't know this guy. I don't know his parents. I don't know these friends. I don't know these people. I'm your father. I love you, and I'm going to protect you. That's why you're not going. I'm responsible for you. I love you with all my heart. That's why. You ask me why, I'm telling you why. I don't know what's going on there, so let's just wait. I'm saying no right now. Only to have them look at me. They asked me why. I just told them why. Only to them look at me and go, that's not fair. Where you, in Jesus' name, you just want to slap them. All right? I mean, I mean that's just the bottom line. So, so the bottom line is, this young man really didn't know the heart of his father. Now, so you know the story. He leaves. He messes up. He's, he, he, he messes up. He wastes his money. He blows his money. He ends up in a pig pen, comes to himself, says, man, I had, it, I had it made back at the father's house. If he would just take me back as a servant. And so you know the story. The father was looking for the boy. When he was a long way off, they hugged. and he, I mean, it's just a great story. And it is a great evangelistic story. But in its pure context, it is not written to lost people. It's not written about lost people. It's written about those of us that have a good father and we strayed away and how the father never leaves us and just because you stray away doesn't mean you still don't belong to God. Now that's one, But this has always been a parable about how many boys? One or two? Two. Always been. So now, now we got to go to the second boy. And, and the bottom line is, most preachers preach about the prodigal son. They never mention the second boy. And Jesus always meant for us to talk about the second boy. Why? Because of verse 1 and 2. Because Jesus was in the house with tax collectors and sinners. And religious people were complaining about it. That's why you have to talk about the older brother. Let's go. Let's look at him. Verse, uh, verse 25. Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and he came and he drew near to the house, and he heard music and dancing. Can I just say something? Can I, listen, when you hear the dancing, brother, that's some dancing. Can I get an amen? Amen? I mean, when you can hear the dancing, whoo, son, they were having a party. All right? They really were. So he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, and he asked him, well, what do these things mean? He said to him, your brother. Come home. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry. Now he's talking about the older he, The brother was angry. He would not go in. He was angry. Therefore his father came out and he pleaded with him. And so he answered and he said to his father, Father, lo, these many years I have been serving you and I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet... You never gave me a young goat, let alone fatted calf. You never gave me so much as a young goat that I, make my, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours, won't even call him his brother. There's bitterness. I mean, you can just, I mean, there's venom in his, in his attitude. As soon as this son of yours, who has devour, devoured your livelihood with harlots. Now, how did he know that? Nobody told him that. Even, even the Bible doesn't say he did that. But he's just being accusatory. You kill a fatted calf for him. And so what the older brother is saying, he said, listen, 
I've been here. I've worked the farm. While my so-called brother's been out living it up, I've been here. I've been by you. I've been faithful. I've been working with you trying to keep this thing together. Now, I want you to, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want to ask you tonight, right now in your life, between these two boys, which one do you most identify with? Do you identify with the prodigal son? By the way, what's prodigal? This is the only time in the Bible the word prodigal is used. And I really kind of, I, I was kind of curious. And I thought, well, what does prodigal mean? So I looked it up in the Greek dictionary. I literally did. And the translation of prodigal out of the Greek means dissolutely. That help? Didn't help me. Oh, well, good night. That ain't no answer. So I did the next best thing. I went to the dictionary. And I looked up the word prodigal. And the word, and, and the word prodigal in the dictionary means rebellious and reckless lifestyle. It means a rebellious and reckless living. And so that's what, the pro, that's what prodigal means. So do you identify right now, sitting here at Bible Baptist on Wednesday night, do you identify with the reckless, wild, prodigal son? Now, if you do, I got good news for you tonight. You are in the right place because we can help you with that. No, God's people said. Or do you identify with the son that's been faithful? The son that is stuck with the father. The son that even though other people are not here and other people are not faithful, you are, you have been. You are a Wednesday night crowd. You, you are faithful. And, and we've had great crowds every night of this revival. And your pastor told me it would be that way because he knows you and he knows your faithfulness and he knows your love for the Lord and he knows your love for this church. So really, which one do you most Identify with the one that's reckless, the one that's rebellious, or the one that is faithful. Now, I know that the whole role of Bible Baptist Church is not here tonight. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because you're Baptist, aren't you? And all God's people say, I don't know about you, but in my Baptist church, we got church members the CIA can't find. Do y'all have those too? I mean, we do. I mean, we just can't find them. I mean, I'm not kidding. I do this. Every Easter, I wish everybody a Merry Christmas. I mean, I do. I mean, you know. So, so, so we, got, we got people, you know. So, so I know. I know that the church, I know everybody that's on the church roll, a Bible Baptist church, is not here tonight. But you're here. And you're here most of every time when the doors open. This church has a crowd of people. That if we had service at 2 o'clock on a Saturday morning, you'd be here. I mean, that's just the way you are. You're faithful. And because of that, because you're here tonight, and because you're faithful, and to those of you that have been saved a while, like me, i got a warning for us tonight. I've got a red flag for us tonight. Now, I know you don't want to hear that. I know you want me to preach for the next 20 minutes on how good it is to be faithful, but i got, I got to warn you. Because those of us that are here when the church doors open, those of us that have been saved a while, we are in danger of what I call the older brother syndrome. The older brother syndrome. Now, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, plain and simple. The older brother syndrome is thinking, not meaning to, but having through the years, because of your faithfulness, because of your giving, because of your investment into this church and even into the kingdom of God, because of your faithfulness compared to so many others' non-faithfulness, the older brother syndrome 
is developing an attitude. Now follow me, listen to me. You listen to me, say amen. This is going to be hard. This is going to be hard. But it's developing an attitude that you're entitled. You're entitled. You're entitled to more. Your voice ought to mean something. People ought to check with you. You're entitled. Maybe you have a title, but you're entitled. And the entitlement comes from only one root place in our life. And that comes from pride and self-righteousness. Now, the thing about pride and self-righteousness is that nobody ever sees it in the mirror. You know there are other people full of pride and self-righteousness, but you just don't think you are. Pride and self-righteousness is not one of the things you see in I've never met hardly anybody that really readily admits, you know what, I'm pride and self-righteous. And so it's something, we know other people are pride and self-righteous, we, we can name them, but we just don't think we are because you don't see it in the mirror. And then we develop this entitlement attitude. Didn't mean to, and you wouldn't admit it, and you wouldn't stand up and say it, but it happens. Look, this really fine-looking woman, very, very astute, uh, classy, woman, older woman, one day came to the church, and she came in the back, and one of the ushers was back there, and, uh, and she, said, she said, Sir, I would like to sit toward the front. And the usher said, Well, ma'am, I want to be honest with you. Uh, that's probably not the best place to sit because our pastor ain't that good. And uh, he's kind of boring. And, uh, and a lot of people fall asleep in here. And I don't want to embarrass you. you I, I, I wouldn't recommend that on your first visit. She looked at him. She said, sir, do you know who I am? He said, no, ma'am, I don't. She said, I'm the pastor's mother. And he said, well, ma'am, do you know who I am? She says, no, I do not. He said, good, see you later. <laughs> I mean, you know, so. Uh, but if we're not careful, we have this entitlement. Do you not know who I am? Do you not know who I am around here? And we have to be careful. And I'm talking to faithful people. I'm talking to good people. I'm talking, to, I'm talking to people that are here when the church door. I'm talking to people that say, well, I'm talking to mature believers. You've been in the Lord a long time. I'm talking, I'm talking to us. I'm talking to me as a pastor and a preacher. If we're not careful, we'll develop the older brother syndrome. Now, what I'm going to do very quickly, I'm going I'm to give three descriptions of pride and self-righteousness and the older brother syndrome, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to come down on you. But I'm going to finish it up with something very positive, and that is the cure to all this. So, so don't, don't check out on me right now. Don't, don't, you, you, I'm going to say some things you're going to get upset with. I already know that. And, and I'm telling you right now, don't, don't go to the pastor. The pa don't, don't, don't even think that, that, that Pastor Don has told me what to preach. He doesn't. If you've got complaints and you don't like this message, send all of your emails, and I'll give you my email address, to Jeff Eisenhower at I don't care .com. Can I get an amen? Amen? Because I'm preaching to me as much as you. But don't check out on because I'm going to finish this up very, very positive. Because I'm going to give a cure. Because there is a cure for this. But until I get to the cure, i got to give the problem. I got to give the diagnosis, and here it is. Number one, pride and self righteousness affects the way we see ourselves. Pride and self righteousness. If you have pride and self righteousness, even though you don't see it in the mirror, one of the checkpoints is it affects the way you see yourself. Look at verse 29. Go, go to verse 29. Listen to what the older brother said. He said, I have never neglected a command of yours at any time. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me and listen well. No person alive can ever say that. Nobody can say that. Nobody can look at the heart of God the Father and say, God, I have never disobeyed you at any time. 
You can't say that. I can't say that. I don't care how much you've got it all together. I don't care how many degrees you have. I don't care what's the title of your name. I don't care how many times you're here at this church. Ain't no man, no woman, nobody here got it all together. And all God's people say it. Turn to the person beside you and say, you don't have it all together. Go ahead. Do it right now. I dare you. All right, that's enough. Y'all, y'all enjoyed that way too much, all right? We don't have it all together. But yet the older brother syndrome, if you're not careful, says, you know what, God? I'm here all the time. Well, just because you're here don't mean you're here. And all God's people say, huh, you ever heard somebody say, well, preacher, I'm with you in spirit. I'm with you in spirit. Hey, man, where were you? Saying, well, I, I was out fishing, but I was at church in spirit. I got news for you. All those empty seats that are full of spirits, that's kind of spooky to me. Can I get an amen? Next time, why don't you come here physically and fish in spirit? Uh, amen? That would, that would be good. But this, this older brother said, I have never transgressed against you that nobody can say that. And if you think that and you think that you don't mess up, you got another thing coming. Nobody can say, listen, listen, listen. There are two groups in the world that are in danger of this kind of attitude. This attitude that I don't mess up. The first group are lost people. Lost people, I'm telling you, they're notorious. Lost people will say, you know what? I'm just as good as them people down there. I'm just as good as them people at church. And you know what? You are. I've had, I've had people say, I've had people say to me, now, I'm just as good as your deacons. And they're really surprised when I say, not only that, I think you're probably better than most of them. My, my first church was in Powhatan, Virginia. Anybody know where Powhatan, Virginia is? Of course you don't. God barely did. But we started a church. We had 19 members. And God really started blessing that church. I mean, it was the fastest growing thing that county had ever seen in 200 years. I mean, it was, it was taking off like gangbusters. And people were very, very upset. And, uh, and so I got the reputation of, uh, uh, you know, of, of, of preaching, you know, salvation and preaching, you know. And I was, you know, and we had other, and we did. We, we had people from other churches coming to check us out because they just found out everything that was going on. And I was in a little old grocery store one day. And a little lady turned around and she looked at me and she went, you, you, you. I, I said, yeah, it's me. She said, I know who you are. She said, you are that new pastor that thinks his people are the only ones going to heaven. I said, no, ma'am, that's not true. I don't think half hours are going. <laughs> anyway, and you know, so... She said, you're a nut. I said, yeah, bless God, but I'm screwed on the right bowl. Can I get an amen? Amen? So, 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 so the bottom line is, a lost, lost people. Lost people say, well, I'm just as good as them people down at the church. And you're right. But what do you hear lost people say? Well, I ain't going down that church because all the hypocrites. I get so tired of that, don't you? I get so tired of lost people saying, I'm not going to go to that church because there's hypocrites in that church. Well, bless God, there's hypocrites at Walmart. They don't keep you from buying groceries. Somebody say amen. Amen? Yeah, there are hypocrites down there. You got a hypocrite for an evangelist this week. Don't you say amen, but you do so lost people are in, always in danger thinking they got it all together, that they're better than Christians. Well, I'm just as good as them Christians down there. But the other group of people is not new believers. New believers, I don't know if you remember or not when you were a new believer, and some of you are new believers, and I'm just going to tell you right now, new believers, don't you ever lose the wonder of Jesus saving you. Don't you ever lose that. I'm not saying you're not going to lose your salvation. I'm saying don't you ever lose the wonder. Don't ever get over it. Don't you, don't, listen, I'm telling you right now, if, they, if, they, if they're going to have a big business meeting in this church where they're going to fuss and fight, you stay home. Don't you get involved in that mess. You keep sweet and you keep close and you just keep praying for, and, and praising Jesus and you keep charging hell wide open with a water pistol, man. And all God's people say. 
But young believers know that there were sinners saved by grace. Young believers know. I didn't know a whole lot. When I, when I got saved, man, I didn't know nothing. I called Psalms Psalms. I really did. I did. I called it Psalms. That's how it's spelled, isn't it? Nobody told me it's Psalms. What's the P doing there? Get it out of there. If it's Psalms, it, started, it ought to start with an S. I saw the book of Job. I thought it was the book of Job. I went, praise God. There's a whole book in the Bible that's going to teach me how to work. I thought John 3.16 was a bathroom on the third floor somewhere. I didn't know. I knew nothing. But one thing I knew, brother, I knew I was lost. I knew that I was blind. But Jesus saved me, and now I can see. I knew that. So the other group of people in the world that are in danger of pride and self-righteousness are older believers. People will say, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I ain't as bad as some people around here. Because after all, nobody's perfect. Duh. Try that argument in front of a judge. Try it. God dare you. What are you in here for? Well, going 50 miles over the speed limit, but nobody's perfect. You end up in jail, son. But older brother, the older brother, older brother syndrome will say, well, you know, nobody's perfect, but, I, but I'll tell you what, I ain't like some of them. I ain't like those people. And we have this tendency to look down our spiritual nose and say, well, I know I'm not perfect, but I ain't like them. I'm not like those people. That's the older Brother syndrome. Now, by the way, you know how I know that? Do, 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 you, do you know how I know you can develop that? And here, here, here's, here's how you can know it. I want you to listen to me. Listen to me say amen. Here's how you know that. When what you used to could only do by the Spirit of God, you can now do it in the flesh. Did you hear that? When there used to be a time when you knew you could not do it without the Spirit of God, now you know you can do it in the flesh. You say, what are you talking about? You remember? Do you remember the first time they asked you to teach that class? What was the first thing you said? I just don't think I can do that. I just don't know. What was the first thing you said? I got to do what about it? I got to pray about it. I just don't know. I, I'm not qualified. And you really meant that. You were honored. But you said, I don't think I can do this. But now, man, you don't even open up that quarter on a Saturday night. You don't call a class. You can whiz off that lesson. You know those Bible stories. You don't have to study anymore. You, re you remember when they first asked you to be a deacon? You remember that? You remember what you said? You say, well, I just don't know, guys. I'm just not qualified. Or at least I hope you said that. I'm going to tell you right now. If they approach you to be a deacon and you said, well, it's about time. Oh, they should have never laid hands on you. And all God's people said. But I don't think you did that. I think when they approached you to be a deacon, you said, I, I'm just, guys, I'm not qualified. And I'll just have to pray about it. And you meant that. And you did. But now, boy, if they don't ask you to be a deacon now, oh, son. I mean, it's not Pentecost, it's Holocaust around here. You remember when they asked you to sing that solo? I just don't know. And when you got up, and you got up here, and you grabbed this microphone, your knees were shaking, and, you were, and, the, and the whole time, and the introduction music was going on, and you were just praying, oh, dear God, get me through this, get me through this. Lord Jesus, I want to do this for your glory. And I, but now, oh, no, listen, they didn't ask you to sing a solo last Christmas, and you, you wanted to take your ball and jacks and go somewhere else. Didn't ask me to sing a solo. I'm just telling you. When you get to the point to where you know personally that what you could only do by the Spirit, now you can do by the flesh. I know preachers like that. I get like that. I get like that. I get like, listen, I get, I get like that where, you know, I, I, think, I think, man, I'm, I'm really preaching. I'm really doing something, you know. I got home one day not, not long ago, and I, we sat down, me and my wife, and, and we had a great service, and, and we had a lot of people come to Christ, and the altar was full, and the place was packed out, and 
I sat on my easy chair, and I'll be honest with you. I went, hey, honey, how many great preachers are there in Fayetteville? She said, one less than you think. <laughs> Amen? These preachers know what, you, what I'm talking about. There are times, man, you're preaching, and you think, man, they're getting it. They're getting it. Man, they ain't getting it. They ain't getting it. And there are, time, there, are, there are sermons that I have preached. I kid you not. I myself could not wait till I got through it. And yet, hearts will get broken. And people say, man, that, gives, that really spoke to me. And I'm thinking, how in the world did that speak to you? Because it's the Holy Spirit of God. It's not by might. It's not by power. If we do anything, ladies and gentlemen, it's got to be through the Spirit of God and all God's people said. The second thing about pride and self-righteousness. Not only does it affect the way we see ourselves, but it affects the way we see others. It affects the way we see others. Now, I, I got to do this real quick. Oh, my goodness. Okay, time, time. Mm. Okay, here we go. Y'all listen fast. All right. all right, here we go. In Luke chapter 7, you don't have time to turn to it right now. But in Luke chapter 7, there is the story of Jesus in a Pharisee's house. And the Pharisee's name was Simon. This is not Simon Peter. It's another Simon. He was a Pharisee. And he was in, he was in Pharisee's house. And a woman comes in, and she opens up a vial of perfume, and she begins to anoint Jesus' feet with her hair. And the Bible says that, uh, or, uh, that, that she was not a good woman. I mean, she, she didn't have a good reputation. And the Bible says that while she was doing this, well, let, let, let me read to you. Don't, don't turn to me. Listen, listen, listen to what I said in Luke 7, 39. Now, when the Pharisee who invited him, him saw this, he spoke to himself. Now, by the way, let me ask, who's he speaking to? T talk to me. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to himself. That means he's doing what? He's thinking. He's not speaking out loud. He's not speaking to Jesus. He's thinking. He's thinking to himself. He's keeping his thoughts to himself. But listen to what he's thinking to himself. Verse 39. He thought within himself, saying, This man, talking about Jesus, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And you can almost hear the background music. Dun, 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 dun. She's a sinner. The very next verse, I love this. Jesus said, Simon, I got something to say to you. In other words, Jesus was reading his thoughts. I don't know about you. That's a pretty good prophet. Can I get an amen? Amen? He's reading his thoughts. He said, Simon, I got something to say to you. And he says, well, say, say it on. He said, well, and then he goes, he goes starts telling Simon this, 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 this story about, about a master and two people who owed him a debt. And he said, there's one that owed him 500 denarii. We talked about that and what a denarii is. And another one that owed him 50 denarii. And he let them both go free. And Jesus said, now Simon, let me ask you something. Which one do you think was the most grateful? And Simon said, well, I guess I, I, I would think the one that owed 500. He got forgiven more. And Jesus said, Simon, you, you, have, you have thought rightly. You have answered rightly, he said. Now, what is Jesus saying? Is Jesus saying that people that have been saved out of deep sin, they're the only ones that can love Jesus the most? No, he's not saying that at all. If that were the fact, my wife couldn't love Jesus as much as I do. My wife didn't come out of deep sin. My, my wife, was, I mean, she's not always been saved, but she got saved as a child, and she's always loved Jesus and served Jesus, but I was, I was a hellion. But I don't love Jesus more than she does. That's not what he's saying. He said, listen, what he's saying is, is there are people who think. There are people who think that they're better than other people. There are people that think that people, and they categorize people and the sin, and they think that there are good sinners and bad sinners. And even though they know they're sinners, they would characterize themselves as good sinners. They're not as bad as the bad sinner. And Jesus is saying this. He said, listen, when you develop that attitude, then what you're really doing is you're categorizing people and you honestly believe that people are worse than you are. It's the older brother syndrome. Ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you, I don't care if you got saved at six years old in children's church. 
I don't care if you're a hell angel and got saved. Every single one of us here tonight, if you're born again and blood bought, every single one of us were good for nothing, hell deserving sinners, and we were all saved by the blood of the Lamb of God. And all God's people say it. And if you don't understand that, and if you get away from that, and you think, well, I'm not as bad as them, or I didn't do what they did, oh, yes, you did. And you say, well, I would never do that. Oh, yes, you would. You just ain't got caught yet. And all God's people say, and unless you don't understand that, you're just like this Pharisee who said, we don't want them in here. We don't want them in here. We don't want those people in here. Matter of fact, we've got, a, we've got a ministry in our church that meets every Monday night. It's called Celebrate Recovery. And it's a ministry to alcoholics and drug, drug addicts and their families and, their, and, and, and codependency and all that. And uh, they're in our church. And uh, they, they come to our church. And, and, and they, even, they, even, they, even, they even bought themselves some T-shirts that said, yes, I'm one of those people. Because they know how Christians do people. And this is what this Pharisee said, if he just knew. If he just knew. See, the older brother syndrome says, I, 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 you know, I deserve more. I, I'm entitled because I've been cleaner. I've been better. And, and if you're not careful, you don't think Jesus owes you as much. And you're not as thankful as you should be because, hey, I've been, I've been pretty good all my life. Number three, pride and self-righteousness affects we, the way we see the Father. Pride and self-righteousness affects the way we see the Father. Now, I want you to follow, now, now follow me, okay? Now, if you're not careful, I want you to listen to me. Older Christians, you sweet people, I mean this with all my heart, that are here Every time the church doors open. If, 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 you're not, if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, if we're not, if, if, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll get so busy serving God that we'll forget to love God. Well, listen, I know people that love to sing about Jesus more than they love Jesus. I, love people, I know people that love to serve the, the Jesus more than they love Jesus. I know people that like to teach about Jesus more than they love Jesus. And if you're not careful, that, that, that's, that's what's going to happen. You see, the older brother watched his father go out every day to the hillside to look for his younger brother. Now, you would have thought that would have blessed him. You would have thought that the older brother, seeing that every day, would thought to himself, you know what, I have got such an awesome father. My father loves his boys so much that it breaks his heart when one of us stray away. You would think that's what he would think, but no, 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 he didn't think that. As a matter of fact, every day he saw the father going out looking for his younger brother, he got mad. He got mad within his spirit, and he started developing an attitude. And he lost sight of the goodness of the Father. And he thought the Father was playing favorites. Now listen, I want you to listen, I want you to listen well. I, I know it's going to get quiet in here. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to finish up this with positive. But you've got to listen to me and listen well. Every single, I've never seen it different. Every single time when my church or probably this church or any other church that I know of begin to get serious about reaching souls for Christ and people start coming in eventually there is going to be a group of people that will rear their ugly head and they will say, what about us? Don't forget about us. Make sure you don't forget about us. Do you want to see people say, oh, yes, I do. But I sure don't want them to sit in my seat and I sure don't want them to take my, my responsibility. Oh, they're welcome as long as they stay in their place. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, what about you? I love you, but I'm telling you, if you're saved, if you're born again, you're in. You're safe. You're safe forever. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. When you die, before your body hits the ground, you're going to be in the arms of Jesus. You ought to thank God for that. But I'm telling you, there are thousands outside of the shadow of this steeple. They don't know that. And they're the ones we need to go after. And all God's people say, it. well, what about us, preacher? What about you? 
Don't forget about us. Well, first of all, you won't let us. We're not forgetting about you. I see it all the time. Hey, we want to see people saved. And when people start coming in, oh, they, they don't like it. They don't like it. What about us? You know, I, I, you know, that's, I know, I know, I know that's, I, I, I hear it. And people say, well, in, in our church, when we really started growing and we went to multiple services, I heard it all the time. Well, preacher, our church is getting too big. It's getting too big. And my answer to that is too big for what? Too many people getting saved? Too many homes being blessed? Too many children being reached? Too many young married couples getting their lives right? Too much offerings going to missions? Too big for what? Well, you know what I mean. We don't know everybody. Well, you don't have to know everybody. I got news for you. Even if you did know everybody, when you die and go to heaven, we're all going to get new names and you got to start over anyway. Oh, those people say. Amen? You don't have to know everybody. Probably don't know everybody here. That's a good crowd. But I'm telling you. Well, I won't get into that because you'll think the preacher put me up to it. And I, I would not want to cause any problem for this sweet pastor and Jeremy in one little shape or form. But I'm just telling you right now, what, what I see around here, you guys, you guys had better be thinking either, either you're going to build more building or you're going to go to multiple services because you guys are offering something that people want to come to and I believe you want them to come but you got to make room for them and all God's people say and you may be sitting here and say well I'll make room for them as long as they don't sit in my seat that's hogwash as a matter of fact not only should you not be uh, wanting them not to sit in your seat you should be standing up and letting them have your seat you, be, you should be saying, I'm glad you're here, brother. Here, this is where my, and my family sit. We'll stand over here in the corner if we have to. Let them bring out the metal chairs. We'll be glad to sit there. I'm preaching now. You know why I know? Because it's quiet in here. Well, all you guys think about is numbers. That's all you preachers think about is numbers. Well... I don't think that's so bad. God thinks about numbers. No, he don't. Yeah, he did. Wrote a whole book on it called the book of what? Numbers, for crying out loud. You ever read the book of numbers? You know what's in it? A bunch of numbers. Why? Because God counts people because people count. And all God's people say, numbers. You better believe it. Okay, I've said enough. You're mad. But I want you to notice something. Notice the two nevers that the older brother brought up. Notice the two nevers because it says a lot about his heart. Listen to this. In verse 12, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give, give me... Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get back to that. The two, first of all, in verse 29, the older brother says, you, I have never transgress against you at any time. Now, we know that's a lie. We know nobody can say that. But listen, listen to the other never. The second never, he says, you never gave me so much as a young goat. Is that so? Is that so, son? Yeah, dad, you've never given anything to me. Oh, really? Now, look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth among who? Say it. Them. Them. He's always talking about him and the son. No, 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 no. It's talking about the two boys. He divided his wealth. Listen, and according to Jewish law, because he was an older brother, he got twice as much as the younger brother. He already got his. He got twice as much as the younger brother. But because he had the older brother syndrome, he developed this attitude, what have you done for me lately? This church don't do nothing enough for me. This church don't do a whole lot for me. And that's nothing could be further from the truth of that. God has been good to you. And God has used you. And God wants to use you. But he will not use you until you surrender your pride and self-righteousness and say, by the grace of God, there go I. Jesus, thank you for saving me. 
me from my sin. I am no better than any worse sinner in this county. And Jesus, the only difference is you have set me free. I'm a sinner, but I'm forgiven. And all God's people say, you never gave anything, you never done anything for me, really? This church hadn't done anything for you, really? Are you kidding me? Older brother syndrome. We forget. Now, now that I've made you mad, let me make you glad. Because there is a cure for all this. We don't have to be this way in our churches. We don't have to have these fusses and fights and buying for position and personality conflict and power struggle that we have in churches all across America. It doesn't have to be that way. And I'll prove it to you. And I can prove it to you by the life of the Apostle Paul. I'm gonna, if you'll bear with me five minutes and then I'm through. Listen to this. Now, Paul wrote 13 books of the 27 books of the New Testament. Would you say amen? Would you agree that the Apostle Paul was an older brother, and all God's people said. He was an older, he was a mature believer. He was an older brother. Paul was saved around uh, 36 AD, just a couple years after Jesus was resurrected. Paul was saved around 36, but I want you to listen to what Paul said. Now, you don't have to turn to it, just listen to Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, which Paul wrote in 57, uh, 56 AD, which is 20 years later, now, Paul has been saved for 20 years when he wrote 1 Corinthians 59. And he said this. He said, I am the least apostles, and I'm not fit to be called. 20 years into his salvation, having written books, started churches, been a dynamite for God, he said, I am the least of the apostles, and I am not fit. To be called. And by the way, let me remind you, Paul really meant this. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit of God wrote that about Paul. The Holy Spirit of God was, was writing this through the pen of Paul. So Paul had to be honest with himself. It's kind of like the book of Numbers, where the book of Numbers says Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. You know who wrote that? Moses. Go figure. Moses wrote that. Doesn't sound very humble. Well, Moses wasn't writing on his own. He was writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's doing the same thing. So Paul honestly means this. He's not saying, he's not fishing. He's not trying to get a pat on the back. Paul honestly believes that he is the least of the apostles and he is not fit to be called. Now, you go to Ephesians chapter 3, seven years after that. Now, Paul's been saved 27 years. 27 years starting churches, being a dynamite for God, God using him in a miraculous way. Three years later, he says, I, now he reevaluates his life. And he says, I am the least of all the saints. He's reevaluating. He said, well, you know, I used to be the least of all the apostles, but I tell you what, the older I get, the longer I'm saved, the more I realize, you know what, I'm the least of the saints. And then, two years later, about 30 years in his salvation, in 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says this, I am the chief of sinners. He's reevaluating again. I am the chief of sinners. 30 years being saved, starting churches, hand of God on him, leading men. Miraculously living life, God delivering him in marvelous ways, using him like nobody else on the face of the planet. And yet through this time, not one time is he entitled, not one time does he think he's anything. He started off saying, I'm the least of the apostles. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. I'm the least of the saints. Well, let me rephrase that. I'm the chief of sinners. You guys live in a beautiful country. You really do. I, I keep talking about it. I, I, just, I, I just think you live in beautiful country. And you really do. I, don't, I, I, think I've been, I think you've had me here in the fall before. I don't know. But when I come here, you guys keep me so busy, I don't see the light of day. But anyway, we won't go there. But, uh, but I have a feeling, 
that uh, in, in, the, in the fall, this place is absolutely gorgeous. I bet the fall... You see, people from where I come from, we make trips to places like this so that we can, believe it or not, we go gaga over leaves. We want to see leaves. We, honestly, we spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars to do a road trip to go see leaves. One year, we're in the mountains of North Carolina, up in West Jefferson, one of the greatest secrets still left in North Carolina. And the leaves were unreal. I mean, you, you, couldn't, you could not have taken a paintbrush and painted those leaves that bright. Nobody would ever believe that they were. That's just the way God does. But I was with a group of senior adults. And they were in the van. And I love them. But they begin to gripe. When are we going to get there? I'm hungry. Got to go to the bathroom. I mean, just, nah, 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 nah. I mean, I'm, I'm trying my best. I'm trying my best to please them. As a matter of fact, I, I, wanted, I wanted them to have such a good experience that, that, that before we left, I took the van and had it washed. And it had, leather, it had, it had vinyl leather seats. And, and I thought I was doing them a favor. And uh, I, you know, I... Uh, I, I shine those seats. <laughs> I, I armor all those seats. And when we went around the mountains and go around the curves, they were... <laughs> Why'd you do that, preacher? You did that because you don't like us. We can't even sit up straight. We're seeing beautiful God's creation, folks. Then I stopped the van. We went to one of those overlooks. They got out. We were all looking. I said, guys, look at those beautiful leaves. They said, oh, it's beautiful. I said, you know, you know what they're doing, don't you? The leaves, they're dying. That's why they're pretty. They're dead leaves. But in their death, they're beautiful. And then I looked at him and I said, I wish you guys would learn that. I wish you guys would learn the closer you get to death and the longer you live for Christ, that you get more beautiful. They've never forgotten that, neither have I. And this is not a, me this is not a message to age, but it is a message to the age of how long we've been saved and I don't know about you, but the longer I have been saved and the longer I walk with Jesus, the more I want to finish well. And I'm going to be honest with you. The more I preach and the longer I'm with Jesus and the more I see, the more I am convinced that I must have him in my life. So, how did Paul do that? As Paul got older, he got more humble. As he got older, he surrendered more to God. How did he do that? I'll tell you how he did it. He tells us how he did it. Here it is, and I'm through. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. For I determined... By the way, Paul's pretty much getting on his way out. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, that's all I've known. I'm not going to get in your personality conflicts. I'm not going to get among all your fussing and fighting. I don't, I, because all I know, all I know is what God saved me from. And the only thing I'm going to get involved in is Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the same cross that saved you, the same cross that's going to take you to heaven, is the same cross that keeps you and he uses you on this earth. And all God's people said, everybody, please stand. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Thank you for your patience tonight. Every head bowed and every eye closed. First of all, first of all, I, I want to ask, 
in a crowd this size, I, I want to tell you, God's got something special for your life. And even though I didn't preach about salvation tonight, I want to tell you about the cross. And I want to tell you that Jesus wants to give purpose to your life. That he wants to forgive you of all your sin. And he wants you to have a life and abundant while you're on this earth, and he wants to give you a home in heaven. If you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't know that, but I'd like to know that, and I'd like for you to pray for me, would you slip up your hand? Anybody here tonight say, Preacher, I'm not sure if I die right now, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Anybody in the building tonight? And we will pray for you. We'll help you. You say, that's one thing we can do around here. We really can help you in that area. I'm telling you. Anybody? Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you, how many of you have been saved for a while? You just been, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not asking you anything other than that. How many of you have known Jesus and you've been walking with Jesus for a while? Would you raise your hand up? Hold them up and keep them up. Okay. All right. You're the guys, I've been t you're the guys and I'm raising my hand. We're the people I'm talking to tonight. This is what I'm asking you to do. I'm not saying you have. I'm not saying you have. I'm telling you. I'm not pointing any fingers, but I am going to ask you to do this. How many of you that just raised your hand would dare pray and say, Jesus, guard me, guard me from the older brother syndrome? Lord, you saved me by your grace. I was a sinner. I was one of those people. I am a sinner. And Jesus, I don't, I'm not entitled. I don't deserve anything. As a matter of fact, what I do deserve by your grace, you're not given to me. And I want to praise you, and I want to thank you for that. But dear Jesus, in your precious name, guard my heart. Guard my heart from being entitled. Guard my heart from being an older brother. Guard my heart from pride and self-righteousness. And keep me close to the cross. I pray it in Jesus' name. How many of you would dare pray that prayer? I'm going to ask you. I want you to slip out, and I want you to come, and I want you to stand here with me right now from all over the building, the balcony, and everybody. Everybody, you raise your hand. I just want you to come, and I want you to stand. We're going to have prayer together. I want, to have, I want you to pray for me, and I'm going to pray for you. Our musicians can go ahead and, well, 